Up to this point, we've only been looking at the first condition for static equilibrium, and that condition states that the sum of the forces must equal zero in order for an object to be in static equilibrium. So what we've been doing is we've been treating objects as a point in space. We haven't looked at the physical dimensions of that object up until now. But what we're going to start to do is we're going to start to treat objects as they actually are, which is where they have physical dimensions. So on the left hand side of the screen, we have something called a space diagram. And this not only shows the forces that are acting on the object, but it also shows the dimensions of the object. And what we're going to be looking at is the second condition that needs to be true for an object to be in static equilibrium. And that states that the sum of the turning moments equals zero. So as we look at this object, some of these forces are going to try to turn the object clockwise, and some of the forces are going to try to turn the object anti-clockwise. In this example here, we have a pivot at the centre. So we have an 85 Newton force, and hopefully you can see that the 85 Newton force is going to try to turn the object clockwise about the pivot in the centre. So I'm just going to make a note here, 85 Newton force, we'll call that force 1, and that's trying to turn the object clockwise. We then have a 65 Newton force. Now the 65 Newton force is going to have an X component and a Y component. And once again, if we look at each of those components, we have component acting downwards, which is going to be trying to turn the object anti-clockwise. And that force is also going to have an X component, which will also be trying to turn the object anti-clockwise. Let's look at our next force. We have a 105 Newton force, which we're going to call force 3. And force 3 has an X component. Once again, hopefully you can see that the X component is going to be trying to turn the object anti-clockwise. And that force also has a Y component, which again is going to be trying to turn the object anti-clockwise. So in the same way that we did before, we're going to need to find the X and Y components of our three forces. Now if we'd already determined the resultant force, we could just reuse those components, as you'll see in later examples. But for now, we're just evaluating the turning moments. So we have force 1. Well, force 1 only has an X component, and that X component is 85 newtons. F1, Y for completeness, is just 0. Next, we have force 2, which has an X component and a Y component. So first of all, F2X equals... Now, as we look at that force, we can turn it into a triangle, like so. We can see that the X component of that force is going to be the adjacent of that triangle, because the longest side is the hypotenuse, the side opposite the angle is the opposite, and the remaining side is the adjacent. And adjacent is hypotenuse cos theta, or in this case, 65 is our hypotenuse, cos of the angle, which is 45 degrees, and that will give us our x component of that force. And that comes out as 45.96 newtons. That force is acting left to right, so it's positive. Next we have F2Y. Well, F2Y is the opposite on that triangle, so we've got hypotenuse sine theta, or 65 sine 45 in this case. And that comes out to be 45.96 once again. Now just take care here, because that component of the force is actually acting downwards, and downwards is negative. If we look at our third force, F3X and F3Y, we can look at that force on the diagram, and we have 105 Newton force at 55 degrees. We turn that into a triangle. Our hypotenuse is the longest side. The side opposite the angle is the opposite and the remaining side is the adjacent. So once again, our x component is going to be the adjacent. So we have 105 cos of the angle, which is 55, and that will give us the x component of that force, and that comes out to be 60.23 newtons.
it's going left to right, so it's positive. And finally, our y component of that force is 105 sine 55 degrees, and that equals 86.01 newtons. And once again, it's bottom to top, so it's positive. So we have all of the x and y components of those forces. Now what I'm going to do to try to help you to visualize what's happening here is I'm going to replace each of the forces, force 1, 2 and 3, with their x and y components on the diagram. So force 1 was our 85 newton force, and the reason why I haven't replaced that force on the diagram is because it already only has an x component. Force 2 was being applied on the bottom left corner of our plate. That force does have an x component, and that x component is 45.96. in the positive direction, and it does have a y component, which is also 45.96, but in the negative direction. And force 3 was being applied to our bottom right-hand corner, and force 3 did have an x component, that x component was 60.23 newtons, positive, so left to right, and it did have a y component, 86.01 newtons, and again that was in the positive direction. Now once again we need to look at which direction each of these forces are trying to turn this plate. So if we start again in the top left corner we can see that the 85 newton force is going to try to turn the plate in a clockwise direction, about the pivot in the centre. The 45.96x component down here is going to try to turn the plate anti-clockwise. The 45.96 Newton force acting downwards is going to try to turn the plate anti-clockwise. The 60.23 X component is trying to turn it anti-clockwise about the pivot in the centre and so is the 86.01 Newton force acting upwards on the bottom right hand corner. Now we can see that the net result of that is probably that this plate is going to want to turn anti-clockwise, but it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is because that resultant turning moment is going to be balanced by an equilibrium turning moment, like so. So we have a resultant turning moment and we have an equilibrium turning moment. The pivot in the centre provides the equilibrium turning moment that prevents this plate from turning. Now in order for there to be a turning moment, a force needs to be offset by a distance. A turning moment is essentially a force times a distance. So if we go back to our condition up here for static equilibrium, that's the same as saying the sum of all of the forces times all of the perpendicular distances equals zero. Now I'll just give you a visual example of this. If you want to open a door, you push the door by the handle. You push the door at a distance away from the hinge. If you were to try to push the door open at the hinge, then you wouldn't create a turning moment, the door wouldn't open. So the only way to create a turning moment is to have a force offset at a perpendicular distance. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the resultant turning moment by doing all of the clockwise moments acting on the plate, minus all of the anti-clockwise moments. And that will give us our resultant turning moment. So we're going to start with our 85 Newton force. Now the perpendicular distance of the 85 Newton force from the pivot is going to be this distance here. And as the pivot's in the centre of the plate, that distance is going to be 1.4 metres. So the turning moment caused by the 85 Newton force is going to be the size of the force, 85, times its perpendicular distance of 1.4. Now we've already said that that's our only clockwise moment. All of the other forces are causing anti-clockwise moments. So let's go round in sequence. We have 45.96 Newton force, once again at a distance of 1.4 metres. It's always the perpendicular distance, so we've got minus 45.96 times 1.4 metres. We've then got 
another 45.96 Newton volts, but this time the perpendicular distance is this distance here, which is half of 1.6 meters or 0 0.8 meters. So we're going to subtract 45.96 times 0 0.8 meters. Then we can move on to our next force, this time the 86.01 newtons. And again, the perpendicular distance between that force and the pivot is this distance here, which is the same as before, 0 0.8 meters. So we need to subtract 86.01 newtons times a distance, 0 0.8 meters. And finally, we have our 60.23 newton force. The perpendicular distance there is this distance, which we've already found to be 1.4 meters. So minus 60.23 times 1.4 meters. Now that gives us a resultant turning moment of minus 135.24 newton meters. It's newton meters because we've multiplied newtons by meters. So that is our resultant turning moment. The fact that it's negative means that it's anti-clockwise. And we know that because we've taken clockwise as our positive direction and we've taken anti-clockwise as our negative direction. We've basically subtracted all of the anti-clockwise turning moments. So please note that although our resultant turning moment 135.24 newton meters anti-clockwise. Our equilibrium turning moment is going to be equal in size, 135.24 newton meters, but opposite in direction. Because as we mentioned when we was referring to our diagram, although we have a resultant turning moment that's being set up by those forces, that's going to be balanced by an equilibrium turning moment that's being provided by the support in the centre.